Lord, I lift Sing it, Art. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way. From the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Y'all did it, I think. <laughs> hey, let's go ahead and pray. We'll let our pastor get up here for about an hour and a half and we'll be ready to go. All right, I'm just kidding. That's a good way to celebrate. Okay. <laughs> Lord, thank you once again today for uh, allowing us to come back here on Wednesday night. I'm glad that you give us that want to one more time. And I pray right now tonight that you just bless our pastor, lift him up, and give him everything that he needs again to tell us the great things that one more time that we need to hear. And uh, thank you for letting us to be able to share them tomorrow with somebody. So uh, we give you that praise and glory for all of this. And Lord, we got a lot of folks, too, on our prayer list. You know who they are, what needs to be done in each and every individual life. And I pray right now that you just touch these lives. You'll just raise them up, Lord, from wherever they're at. And, and I get them back here safe and sound. So we're going to thank you for doing that, too. But, but, Lord, tonight we love you, and we ask if you would, please, now go with us. Lead us and guide us, and we ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. I do appreciate all of you that sent uh, emails and uh, Facebook things, whatever they are, and uh, all the things and all the the wishes and the gifts and things. I appreciate it so much. But more than anything, I appreciate you as an individual. So we appreciate your love and your concern. Um, I do I do need to update you briefly. Some of you have got some of the prayer requests we've sent out this week about things going on in Africa. And one of the members of our BBF Africa Church was visiting with a friend of hers at another church with her family, and uh, there, was an ex- there was an explosion at the church. The church was attacked by radical Muslims, and one of the children died in the... So pray for that family tonight. Uh, and... Of course, may have, many of you may have saw where there was 40 students uh, at a Christian college that were that the Christian college was assaulted. And 40 of those children were killed by Muslims. So it's here, guys, and it's getting closer and closer to home. It, well, when it gets to God's family, it's already home, no matter where it's at. So. Do remember to pray for them and pray for two things. Pray for protection for God's people and salvation for the Muslims. I love their soul. I can't for the life of me understand their philosophy or their religion, but I I know what it says and I know why they believe what they believe, but I, I find it absolutely abhorring that people could believe that you kill people because they don't believe your religion. That's... We're supposed to love people and hope to reach them with the gospel of Christ. And I'll be honest, it's hard to love people that's trying to kill your brothers and sisters. But we must. We must. That's, that's, that's an absolute must. Now, having said that, do remember to continue to pray for. I did speak finally. got a hold of Michael today. I was a little bit concerned, but unable to get a hold of him early this morning. But I didn't get a hold of him this afternoon. So uh, he's still okay, and, the, and their churches are going through. Uh, what they're going to be going through right on. So remember to hold them up to the Lord. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. 
Uh, we actually stopped in verse 26, but I'm going to ask you to back up to verse 23 so that we kind of get a, uh, a little running start on our subject matter. And I want to take you tonight to a place maybe you've never been scripturally. I'm sure you have in one sense as far as, but I want to take you into the Holy of Holies tonight. I want you to get a glimpse of the work of Jesus Christ as he worked his powerful all forgiving blood sacrifice so that you and I tonight could go to heaven. And uh, if you ever, ever begin to take your salvation for granted, I want you to know what it took for you to go to heaven and me to go to heaven. Uh, the Bible makes it plain, and maybe, I, how many believe this? I've heard people say this so often that, well, all you need to do uh, to go to heaven is uh, believe in Jesus Christ. How many of you heard that? Well, you know that that isn't all there is to that. If you, It's just technically that's true to one sense. But biblically, there's more to it than that. In fact, I read a verse uh, um, that you may need to keep in your mind. Uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 24. I'm going to read it. You know, It's not on the board tonight. We're not using it. But it says that we, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption of that is in Christ Jesus. And uh, verse 25 says, Whom God has set forth to be a perpetuation or satisfaction through faith in His, what? Faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remissions of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. So Paul is saying that faith in Jesus Christ is faith in the work that he's done by the shedding of his blood. So Paul makes it plain that salvation or remission of sin, sins can only be obtained as a gift of God that's been purchased by faith in his blood. Simply said, his blood was enough to atone for every sin of every human in the world that would trust him as Lord and Savior, and nothing else can give you or I forgiveness of sins. It's His blood. Did you get that? And that faith that we have is in His blood. Him, yes. His work, yes. Because having faith that Jesus Christ was who He said He was is not what the Bible talks about when it's talking about faith in Him. It's talking about faith in the work that He accomplished on the cross that God sent Him to do to be, to be a perpetuation. That means satisfaction for the sins of the world that God would accept that blood, only His blood, for the remissions of sin. Now go back quickly to Hebrews chapter 9, and we'll drop in in verse 20, 23 so that we can understand the better sacrifice that we just read about in Romans chapter 3. He said, It was therefore necessary, beginning in verse 23 of chapter 9, that the pattern of things in the heavens... Now listen, we read about the tabernacle. We read about, uh, we will read later on, about the temple itself. But the tabernacle was only a replica of the one in heaven. God gave Moses, and if you go to the book of Exodus, you can study through it and you'll find all the intrinsicies, I can't even say the word, intrinsic things that God did and, and how specific and even measurements. There was no no absolute possibility that you, if you did it, if, if Moses had done anything inconsistent with what God said, it would not have been a pattern of the one in heaven. So we're reminded here that we're going to be talking about something on earth that is only a shadow of that which is in heaven. And we're going to see that word used actually in chapter 10. But we'll get here and he says, And it was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in heaven should be purified with these, talking about the blood of, of bulls and of calves and of goats, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these, simply said that God would not allow the tabernacle in heaven to be purified by the blood of bulls and goats. It would take a better sacrifice. And that better sacrifice was the blood of Jesus Christ that we just got through talking about in Romans chapter 3. So my faith is not in the work of the shedding of blood of bulls and goats. 
except for the covering, the kephar of the Old Testament, the covering until the redemption came in the person of his son. Verse 24, he said, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which is the tabernacle on earth, which are the figures. And see, we keep seeing the word pattern. Now we see the word figure. And later we'll see the word shadows. And each time it's talking about God was speaking to Israel and to us, I was just talking with Brother Bill about the Old Testament, how important the Old Testament is. And by the way, we don't have two Bibles. We have one. That means from Genesis to Revelation. It's the Bible. And in the Old Testament, we'll see the pattern of the New Testament. And Christ didn't stop the laws of the Old Testament except the sacrificial laws. He fulfilled the sacrificial laws. So he said, now we see not only a figure of the true, but he he is entered into that tabernacle into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Isn't that a blessing? Do you think about that? Jesus died and took his blood, his own blood, to the tabernacle in heaven for you and for me. Not the bloods of bulls and goats, which was typically what God told him to do until the Lamb of God came. And so he says in verse 25, not yet that he should offer himself often. And here's what, how many remember, we're going to, we're going to go back over to, uh, chapter six, I believe it is, to help some people to understand chapter six, verse four and six has always been a, a, a turmoil to some people. We'll go back there in just a minute. But get this. He said, not yet that he should offer himself often. In other words, every year. As the high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others. So he said, Christ is not going to offer himself once a year as the priest did in the Old Testament. For then must he, Christ, often have suffered since the foundation of the world. Here's what he means. Christ would have to be re-crucified every year if he had to go back and redo salvation. In fact... If Hebrews, let's go to Hebrews chapter 6 and look at that right quick while we're here. And just touch on it just for a minute. Chapter 6, verse 4. We touched on this when we were here. For he says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost or sharers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. What's impossible, here's is, verse 6, if they fall away, if they fall away, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance. Why? In other words, if you could get saved and get lost, Jesus would have to come back and die again to redeem you the second time. It's impossible for you, look what it says, for it's impossible to renew them again into repentance. Why? Seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put Him to open shame. That's exactly what we found here in chapter 9. He didn't offer Himself offered. He offered Himself how many times? Once. Now look what He says. Let's continue. And He says, continue. He says, for then, verse 26, for then must He often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once, in the end of the world, or the end of the age, if you will, hath he appeared to do what? Put away sin. Not cover it. Put away sin. How? By the sacrifice of himself. Not of bulls and goats, but the sacrifice of himself. Now, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Now, how can you see what we just did? We just walked into the holy place of God, and we've seen the finished work of Jesus Christ, that never again will he come back 
and offer himself on a place called Calvary, never again will that precious blood drip down into the soil. Never again will a priest, a high priest, ever have to take the blood of bulls and goats because Jesus was not only the high priest, he was the offering itself. And he took his own blood back through the veil in heaven, back into the holy place of God, and he took his own blood, placed it on the mercy seat in heaven. The Father accepted that sacrifice for the sins of many, and our faith tonight is in the blood that Jesus shed, not in our works, not in the works of the tabernacle, but in the fulfillment of all the pattern that God has set forth for Israel up to this very day, he offered himself how many times? Once. He will never come back and die again. That's why it's so important to understand that your faith in Him as a real faith, in fact, we were over in chapter 6, we was talking about where we were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Once we come into a knowledge of Jesus Christ and a birth into the family of God, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us completely. We're going to get into a couple of verses in chapter 10 that may bother you a little bit, but you need to get this understood. He is not going to offer a sacrifice for your sins ever again. If once wasn't good enough, you're in trouble. But once is always good enough. Remember what it says, that He entered into the presence of God for us. And in chapter 9, verse 12, He has obtained eternal redemption for us. How long is eternal? Does it have an ending? Does it have a beginning? No, it's open on both ends. Why? Because the redemption that he obtained was the picture that God began in the, there, in the, there in the Garden of Eden when the innocent animal was slain and Adam and Eve were covered by the skin of that animal, but there had to be bloodshed in order for there to be redemption of, redemption of sin and forgiveness of sin. In fact, the Bible tells us, and we've already talked about it other, is without the shedding of blood, there is no redemption of sin. But the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us forever. Now, someone will say, well, wait a minute. Does that mean that, that since I've been saved, I can do anything I want to? Let me say so. If you ask that foolish question, you probably need to get saved. Here, listen to me carefully. You have been redeemed by the blood of God's Son that He let die, and His sins, your sins are cleared because He took your sins and my sins for us. And if we take that lightly and trample underfoot the Son of God's blood, I want to promise you, you'll face an angry God. And the Bible says that I promise you it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. He was talking to Christians there. So we might better understand that being saved eternally does not give us a license to sin. But not understanding your relationship with God that's been purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ can lend itself to all kind of difficult things. So he continues and he says, Now, he is coming again the second time without sin unto salvation. Chapter 10, verse 1. Now we're going to get into the Holy of Holies. Walk in deeper. And he said, For the law... Having a shadow, there's that word again. See, we saw the word pattern, we saw the word figures, and now we see the word shadow. All three of these words basically are saying everything that happened in the Old Testament in the sacrificial system was only a pattern and a, and a, and a shadow and a figure of things to come. And by the way, it says, look at this, he says it was a shadow of good things to come. You see that? Let me tell you something tonight. Good things are not coming. They're already here. You hear me? Jesus Christ, when He came, He is and He was the good thing. He was that thing that redeemed us. And I want to say something to you tonight. We come to the house of God to worship Him. We don't come here tonight to try to repent to get salvation again because it's been purchased for us by His blood. It's not our salvation. It's His. We didn't invite Him into our life. He invited us into His. You understand what that means? That means the eternal life that we celebrate tonight is not ours. We're sharing His life. If I don't cock your pistol, you probably need a brand new pistol. You know why? I'm going to heaven because of His life, not because of mine. I'm going to heaven because of His blood and the forgiveness of sins. And listen to me carefully. 
I say this so you make sure there's no mistake about it. If you take sin lightly, I doubt your relationship with God. And so does he. If sin is not a real problem for you as a believer, as you claim to be a believer, and you can sin without any, any, any twangs of guilt or, or, or conviction from the Holy Spirit of God, then one of the first things I'd do is go somewhere and get saved. You hear me? Here's why. I promise you God will never let one of His children sin without convicting them. He'll convict you before you do it. I mean, you know that. Start to do something and you hear that small, still voice say, uh-uh. And you say, well, will He keep me from doing it? No, He'll just make you wish you hadn't. And that's what you need to know. When we get to this part, sometimes people think, well, well, you know, my salvation has been purchased for me. It sure has. But I want to tell you something. It's precious in the sight of God who gave His Son to give it to you. And so don't ever take it lightly. So he said, the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image. You understand that. You know the difference in a shadow and the very image. You see a shadow of an individual. You don't see the outline of their face. You don't see the intrinsic part of them. But, see, in the Old Testament, all we could see of the shadow of things to come. But since Jesus came, we can see the very image. We see Him face to face. So He made it plain. And He says, but, get this now, but the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of those things can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually... Make the comers thereunto what? Perfect. You see, all of that blood sacrifice in the Old Testament was never intended to make a believer perfect in the eyes of God. Now, we're going to bother you a little bit. I know the word perfect lends itself primarily to completeness or or maturity. But here it has the idea of not just being sinless in our lifestyle, but sinless in the eyes of God because the blood of Jesus Christ has not left one sin uncleansed in your life. I said this one time, and I had somebody really look at me strange. The day you got saved, or I got saved, I need to tell you something. The day you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord, you were just as perfect spiritually as He was. Why can I say that? Because remember the verse that says, He became, He that knew no sin, became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God. Did you hear that? Now, I know. Please don't go out of here saying, well, the preacher said we were all just like Jesus. That is not what I said. I said, as far as your forgiveness of sins, the day that He forgave your sins, you were absolutely... Don't you... You know what? I've often thought about when we had altar call is bring a 12-gauge shotgun with me. And when people get saved, just boom. That way they go home perfect. They don't have a chance to go out and sin anymore. It would probably cut down on the altar calls a little bit. But, uh, you know, it might. You know, people to get to heaven clean without having to go out. And by the way, the blood of Jesus Christ doesn't just cleanse us from the sins we have sinned. It cleanses us from the sins we're going to sin. 